Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven of God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice in the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. He will dwell with, dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and they shall show no more. Neither shall there be no more.
Dear gracious God, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we thank you that, uh, Lord, you bring us together in worship each week. Lord, we thank you for this past week as we gathered around tables with friends and family. Lord, that we could have festivities with our friends. Lord, we thank you that we too as a church gather around tables and enjoy one another's presence in your presence. And Lord, we thank you for the future hope that we find in the festival friends in the future. And so right now, Lord, help us to celebrate together the joy that we have in all the festivities that you uh, give us the joy to be able to experience. And right now, Lord, prepare us this week for the week to come. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated as we join together for our next song.
in the statement of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. In the third day he arose from the dead. He ascended to the dead and sits to the right hand. Scripture reading is Romans 8, 18-23. I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth com comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the child, children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. 
and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Well, today we're going to be looking at a passage that is uh, a little bit puzzling, um, but I, I think it's a passage that as we're preparing for Advent and coming off of Thanksgiving is one to kind of recognize and realize the importance of what this passage speaks about. Our passage today is about uh, the glory about to be revealed, and I think it's a very positive understanding that in our world where there's so many struggles, that rather than having our main focus on the struggles of the world, that we focus on the hope that's to come in the future. Now that's not to say that I'm suggesting that we deny the struggles that people are having, but that in the midst of all the struggles that we see and the sufferings within the world, that we keep our eyes focused on the hope that Christ gives us in the future. This passage is most oftentimes looked at as an end times passage, and it pushes uh, away sometimes in the hearts of people from the present hope that we can have that I believe this passage also speaks to. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that God has revealed to us. That's how this passage begins that we're looking at today. And so today, let's look forward to the hope, the hope that awaits us, the hope that we can have bringing about tomorrow, the longing for what God is doing in our world, I can remember my grandfather, he had this favorite thing, and the more older he got, the more he said, he said, boy, this world's going to hell in the handbasket. And it was kind of like he didn't understand, and I can remember in, in my time as I started into faith saying, Grandpa, but isn't God doing a new thing? Isn't he improving who we are? Isn't he bringing us to the fruition of, of what it is to be humankind and the nature that God created us to be? I don't know about that, but the world's going to hell in a handbasket, you know, kind of thinking. And so I, I used to get a kick out of that. But, but here's another part of it that this passage speaks to that I think is very important. We talk about the self-focus of people and how self-focus works within the context of our world today, oftentimes, and how we try to counter that self-focus. But I want us to listen to what this passage says because it goes beyond just self-focus. <laughs> and it also talks about the nature of humanity, about how we're so human-centered or human-centric in our thinking. And as Christians, oftentimes we look at the scripture as being hope just for us as humankind. But this passage speaks a bit beyond that. Gives us a little deeper understanding as it says, creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of God's children. Hey, the, the creation is longing for the revealing of God's children. Now, if we look at the world today and how we as humankind have treated it, do you think creation has quit longing for that? That they have, that created, has seen humankind, the, the nature of the children of God? Because you see, it says, for creation was subjected to the futility, the cluttering, the damage done by humanity, by us, not of its own will, but of the will of the one who subjected it, which is us. That we haven't taken the significance of the very first commandment within Scripture to care for the garden. So it goes long beyond just selfishness, but goes into the human centeredness of how we think we have authority over things to where we can destroy what God loves. And it goes far beyond just us. All things were created in God, and God loves all things. In hope that creation itself will be set 
free from the bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom and the glory of God's children. Folks, until I think we understand how God loves all that God created, it's hard for us to understand the fullness of what God desires for us to be. We know that the whole of creation is groaning in labor pains until now or until this point of starting to receive an understanding that we were created with intention and purpose as humankind as servants of God, servants of each other, and servants to all of God's creation. Did you hear that? Creation awaits eagerly and longing for the revealing of God's children, who we are. All creation suffers us until God's work is complete. It's subject to what we do. And I think about the meaning of what this means and the purpose and the, and the person of Jesus Christ and how even when Christ came, God in the form of humankind, he could have come in any way that he chose. I mean, if Jesus is truly God, it seems rational to believe that he could have chose to come in any way he desired. But he came not to those who were celebrating, those who were privileged, who had power and strength and wealth. He came to the lowly. The incarnation of God was brought into the lowly, to the least. And he dwelt among them. And when I think about what it means to be followers of Jesus, we have a lot to celebrate. But I think that in this, the suffering of the world is part of what we engage as well. That we don't isolate ourselves from the suffering of the world, but we engage the suffering of the world in a positive way. We live in a time, and I've mentioned this many times, of rampant individualism. It is our culture. It seems as though the highest virtue, in fact, there was a philosopher that made this famous, Ian Rind, was gained or gauged by our ability to be selfish. Gauged in measures like personal freedom and individual rights. Over looking at what we can accomplish for the joy of others. The joy of creation. You know what kind of life stands in opposition to redemption? The sinful life. Sinfulness is equal to Selfish living, selfish life. Every sinful act at its core base is based in selfishness. Concerned about our joy over the joy of others. Concerned about our well-being over the well-being of others. Concerned about what we want God to look like instead of what God is. Creator of all things. Lover of all creation. Here's a kicker, we're not an island. None of us can live by ourselves. God created us to be creating people, but there's nothing we can create by ourselves. There's nothing we can design by ourselves. Every single thing we have, even this beautiful piece of origami here, has thousands of years of people working in the Spirit of God and the creativity we were given to be able to create something this simple. Our artisanship goes on back so many generations. <coughs> Everything
everything we do also has an effect on everything. <clears throat> everything we do. Everything we do affects all creation. I remember when I was caught in sin, I'm not going to get into that, but as I was caught in sin, I remember saying to my pastor at that time that, uh, well, at least I didn't hurt anybody. He said, Francis, you hurt everybody. You hurt everybody in your family. You hurt everybody in your church. You hurt everybody in your city, in your state, throughout the world. And not only that, everybody in history from this point forward by what you did. Now, I know that that's a hard thing to grasp a hold of, but we have an impact by what we do on everything from the point in which we do it forward. Whether that be something negative or something positive, we never do anything that just affects us. And when we live in sin, we don't know the end result of what it has done to others. And I hate to tell you, but I know full well that because of my sin in the past, I'm responsible for the death of others. And you may be as well. But I also know that in the positive things in life, we can have a positiveness in others that goes far beyond what we can understand or even comprehend. That we affect everything. And that goes not just for the human-centered part, but all of creation. You know the old claim that it takes 10 positives to overcome a negative. And that may be true. But I tell you, the way we live transforms everything around us. And we can't know the end result of our actions that are lived out through time. Could it be, too, that as the scripture kind of speaks about, when one is lost and found, all of heaven rejoices. But I believe this scripture shows us that all creation rejoices along with the angels. Jesus, you see, had a transforming effect on much of the world. And as followers of Jesus, we too have an effect on all of humankind by the way we live. A good and necessary question for each of us to ask ourselves that we will never know the complete answer to is have we experienced in our life the ability to do good that could transform the world to be a better place? Have we as a church affected our community to be a better community in the past? Are we affecting our community today to be a better community today? And are we affecting our community to be a better community tomorrow? It's so important that we ask this question. We may never know the extent of how our good will be transforming to the world, but it is what God has called us to be. How can we be a more positive influence as God's people? How can our good intentions bring about great good of love as a motivator for people loving one another? You know, one of the things that hits me is, and I hate to make this political, but I'm going to for a second. Building walls is antichrist. Building large tables and inviting people in who are your enemies is Christ-like. Joining together with others who are different from us and expanding who it is through the love that we share as a motivator and the language that we use about one another, not casting anybody aside, but loving is transforming of the world. No one has changed 
through judgment, and I hope you don't hear that as a judgment for me, but as a motivator to allow love and participate in that love and grace extended to others to be the positive transformation of the world like Christ was. A willingness to carry that out even to the cross. The humiliating place of the cross. And while all creation is longing for the revealing of God's people in the end, we too, as believers, can have a lot of hope as well because it says not only is creation, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit, who God has indwelled, that we know God's presence within us, grown inwardly, awaiting for the adoption and the redemption of our bodies, of who we are. And that's why today we're looking at the Festival of Friends. And what does a Festival of Friends look like? Are we just talking about something in the future, some eschatological thing out there? when all creation comes to its final place and God reveals us all in heaven? Or is this festival of friends something that we participate in each and every day? Bruce Coburn, in these words, he wrote, an elegant song will hold out long when the palace falls and the temple's gone. We all must leave. It's not the end. Everything has a life expectancy. But here's the hope. We'll meet again in the Festival of Friends. The next one goes right along with our scripture today as well, even though the words are kind of odd. Black Snake Highway, Sheet Metal Ballet. So much snow on a summer day, whatever happens, it's not the end. We'll meet again in the Festival of Friends. I tell you, when we look at how the world is constantly changing so rapidly, where we find ourselves caught in situations we don't expect, like snow on a summer highway, it's not the end no matter what happens. Those of us who are of faith will meet again in the Festival of Friends. The next one's a little more difficult theologically, and you have to go way back in history for this one. Some of us live, and some of us die. And someday God's going to tell us why. Open your hearts and let Christ in. That's your ticket to the Festival of Friends. When I talk about this and the sense of theology, it goes a little bit more deeply than what we might as Methodists lean upon as far as the issues of life and death. But Bruce Coburn being backed in a tradition of Catholicism that goes way back. Sin is equal to death. And many of these scary images we have come out of theology. The walking dead those who have yet to receive Christ that don't even realize they're dead in sin. That life and death is not about the physical substance of the person, but it's about the spiritual substance of the person based on our relationship with God. And so some of us live and some of us die. Someday God's going to tell us why. But here's the thing. Open your hearts. Let Christ in. That's the ticket to the Festival of Friends. Death is a loss of personification of who God designed us to be. Not living as Christ desired us. God desired us. The Creator desired us to live. And then he talks about the participation in us in this invitation. Smiles and laughter and pleasant times. There's love in the world, but it's hard to find. And there's some truth in that, isn't there? The opposite of sin is selfishness, but you could also say the opposite of selfishness 
is, or the opposite of selfishness is also love. Smiles and laughter in pleasant times. There's love in the world, but it's hard to find. I'm so glad I found you. And I'd like to extend an invitation to the Festival of Friends. God has called us to this Festival of Friends, but he's also extended us the ability to engage others and invite them as well. That's the open table instead of a wall to block people out, but to invite people into the Festival of Friends. And that begins today. That begins in every meal that we have. It's one thing to go out and to feed the poor. It's another thing to invite them to sit at the table with you. And I think that if we look at it as justice, social justice begins on giving food to the poor, but social justice moves in its fullness when we invite them in to be in relationship at the festival of friends beside us at the table. And then the very last verse. Like an invitation of a good thing past, these days of darkness will not last. Jesus is here. He is living amongst us. He is in the hearts of the children of God. And he's coming again. There is an eschatological future hope. A hope for today and a hope for the future. That's good news, amen? Things aren't the way that they're supposed to be yet. But they will be. Jesus is here and he's coming again to lead us to the festival of friends. What a gift. The takeaway that I hope you hear here today is there are great hopes in our ever-changing world. But folks, if you think that it's going to be someday tomorrow like it was yesterday, you're wrong. God is constantly doing a new thing in a changing world. It's never going to go backwards. It's always going to be moving forward. There's great hope in this ever-changing world because God's work is continuing until its completion when the children of God are revealed. What we do, too, is important in all things. We have an effect on everything. God has gifted us with the ability to be positive and negative influencers for everything that's happening and everything that will happen in the future. And so what we do, the decisions we make, are so important. And all creation is waiting on the children of God to be revealed. What we do within the creativeness of the world of what God has created there's another theological belief that everything comes from God and returns to God. The question is, will we return to God with our personification, with who we are? And when we live as we were created to live, we will. That's heaven. When we don't, that's another theological thing, annihilation. I believe that God created us and that in the end, God will reveal himself to each of us in such a way that we will see our creative nature within ourselves and God will redeem us. And one day we will all celebrate together in the great festival of friends gathered around the table in the presence of God for eternity. We have much to be thankful for today if we recognize how God is at work within our lives and within the world. And if we look for the positive, even in the midst of the suffering, embrace the suffering, but embrace the celebration as well, just as Christ Jesus did. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, and we ask, Lord, that you help us to embrace the world around us in a way that emulates Jesus Christ. The author and perfecter of faith, the living example of Christ's presence with us to demonstrate to us who we were created to be. And so right now, Lord, while we can't live in your perfection and we trust in your grace, help us, Lord, as we develop in faith to embrace the idea, Lord, that we can be transforming to the world by following in your footsteps. Lord, that we can have the festival of friends every time we gather together with anyone. If we have open hearts, if we have open minds, we have open tables. So right now, Lord, I pray that in these few moments as we close in a time of prayer, that Lord, if there's something we need to participate in in a different way, Lord, that you make it clear to us as we pray Help us to embrace the suffering of others as we pray for them and allow those prayers to lead us into actions. Lord, we thank you that you trust us enough that you created us in such a way that we can participate in the good that you're doing throughout all creation. So today we celebrate we give you thanks in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.